Okay, in this session, I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit baptism. And I realize, and I want to be very compassionate, I want you to understand that I grew up um, old school Pentecostal holiness in a holiness sort of system. They were wonderful, wonderful people. And once again, everybody has their quirks, everybody has their stuff. Uh, they were wonderful people. I was also discipled by an independent, fundamental, premillennial Baptist school, okay? So, um, so, and they were wonderful people, wonderful people. They didn't agree on much, but they were very wonderful people. And in and, and my life, my spiritual life was formed by a combination of both of them. So, look, for, before we talk about Holy Spirit baptism, it's very important for us to understand that we don't, we don't look down on any person, and it, whether they agree with us or disagree with us, we're all children of God, and we're just on our journey with God together, okay? And, and we're on the same team. I mean, but we, we have to address this issue because I want to... Um, if, if you grew up, there's basically three modes of thought around this. One is called cessationism, which basically just says that the sign gifts ceased when the Bible was completed. And I, once again, half of my discipleship was with a group of people who were would have been considered cessationists. They believed that all of this stuff ceased when the Bible was completed. Of course, there's some holes in that. And, and, the, and the holes are that um, when was the Bible actually completed? I mean, was it when the last pen stroke was written? Was it when, was it, was it when, when the Council of Nicaea put it together? I mean, when exactly are you talking about there? And so, so th that argumentation, kind of, and look, once again, if you come up in that kind of environment, I understand. I do. I, I'm with you. And if I wanted to play devil's advocate, I could teach it. I could teach that side of things because I understand it well enough. I, and, but there's some holes in it. I mean, you know, first it's like, well, that only happened to the apostles. And then, of course, when you read the book of Acts, it happened to a bunch of people. So they say, well, it, it only happened to Jews. And then, of course, you keep reading, and wait a minute, it happened to Samaritans and people in Ephesus. And you're going, well, wait a minute, it happened to even Gentiles and all kinds of, uh, of, of folks. And so, and so you run out of things to, 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 to box it in. And so finally you say, well, it was only for before the Bible was completed. And, and the reason they say that, their scriptural reference for that is it says, um, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that, just, when that which is perfect has come, that which we do in part will cease. And so they use the word cease there to say, well, it ceased. And they say that the perfection that was coming was the Bible. Well, you know, of course, well, what then, what, do we not know anything anymore? I mean, is there no prophetic words anymore? I mean, did all of that cease? And so, but see, that scripture also says this. It says, for then we will see him face to face. And so um, to me, it seems to be talking about when Jesus comes back and we see him face to face, at that point, we will fully know. Therefore, there will be no need for words of knowledge, for prophetic utterances, for any of this stuff, because our knowledge will be in full. So you, you have that kind of system. And then you have, of course, you have the extreme Pentecostals. And the extreme Pentecostals, um, they're wonderful, wonderful, weird folks. But they, 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 they believe that you don't even get the Holy Spirit until you can speak in tongues. And so, um, and so you have this whole sort of, um, the, the problem with that is you've got this whole sort of nanny, nanny, boo-boo, we got something you ain't got sort of mentality, and it turns people off. I mean, it just, it turns people away from what you're trying to get them to do. And of course, that's never been the central belief of, of, of Christianity, is that you don't get the Holy Spirit until you can speak in tongues. And so we can box ourselves in there and kind of make tongues the, the Pentecostal green card, and if we're not careful, we, it, it lets us define who everything we are. Like, we can be mean to the person at the grocery store, but if we can speak in tongues, man, we're in, you know? And, and that's not at all what God was about, nor is it a weird sort of experience. It was never intended to be weird. I'm going to show us through the scriptures tonight that actually what we've made to be super spiritual or super um, so kind of weird sort of thing actually was very normal. It was something that they just considered, yeah, it's, this is just what happens. So with that in mind, with a total balance and, and, and wanting to stay in the center of scriptures and that kind of stuff, I want to talk to you tonight about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I want to make a couple of observations. Number one, the believer receives the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. Now, now there's, a lot of, there's a lot of scriptures that back that up. John 20, 22, Romans 8, 9, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, amongst others. But the one I want to read is Romans chapter 8, verse 9. And I, I want us to remind ourselves who wrote this. Paul, the apostle Paul is writing this, and his writings are going to come back at the end. It says this, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So what's he saying? Two things. One, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. Number two, if you're not saved, you do not have the Holy Spirit. 
So if someone's saved, they have the Holy Spirit. If they're not saved, they don't have the Holy Spirit. And so, so the believer receives the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. There's a receiving of the Holy Spirit. Now with that in mind, in John 20, verse 19 and 22, you see the experience of the disciples. So you have the, the 12 disciples minus one who killed himself. Okay, So you've got 11 disciples, and this was their experience. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, now I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So let's assume that Jesus isn't kidding. And let's assume that he's being very serious. And so you have this moment with Jesus and the disciples, and it says he breathed on them. Now remember, the Hebrew people believed that God existed in their very breath, that, that God was as close to them as the air that they were breathing. The actual word for spirit is breath. The, the word in Hebrew is ruach. The word in Greek is pneuma. To get pneumonia means you cannot breathe. There's no breath in you. There's not enough breath. Is pneumonia. So, so to breathe on them, he was breathing the Holy Spirit onto them. It says that they received the Holy Spirit. Now in light of Romans chapter 8, verse 9, if someone receives the Holy Spirit, what happened? They got saved, or what we would call, we'll use the term, they, they, got, they got saved. And, and if you think about John 20, that, that is that everything you need to get saved was sitting right there. Uh, Jesus died, he rose again, they would have believed he was Lord, he would have, they would have believed he rose again. And so they would have had everything right there for salvation to take place. And so they get saved, and of course when they get saved, they receive the Holy Spirit. So, so number one, the believer receives the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. But number two, there is a baptism in the Holy Spirit for each believer which is separate from the receiving at salvation. So there's a baptism in the Holy Spirit that's separate from the receiving at salvation. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, this is what's going on. The same group of people in John chapter 20 were sitting around waiting on, on the Holy Spirit. They, they asked God, they said, you know, what, what should we do? I mean, these are people chomping at the bits. They'd received the Holy Spirit. Jesus was there. He breathed on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. Assuming he's not kidding, when Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, what happened? They received the Holy Spirit. So these people who would walk, talk, eat, slept, spend all their time with Jesus, they're chomping at the bits to get at what Jesus wants them to do. And he, they said, what do you want us to do? And he says, wait, wait. And this is what he says to them. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So, so for the disciples, this was their experience. They received the Holy Spirit at salvation. And then there was a 40-day period of time. And then the Holy Spirit comes on them. And whatever was true about this experience, this is what was true about it. That Jesus thought it was so important that he told 11 men chomping at the bits who would have known him way more intimately than any of us would have. He told them, you're not ready. Stay here until this thing happens. Stay here until this moment happens. So whatever it was was very, very important. And it did not happen when they received the Holy Spirit at salvation. It was something different. It was, and, and it didn't really have anything to do with Pentecost. Pentecost happened a couple days later. This was something separate. So in the, in the New Testament, the disciples' experience was you get saved and you receive the Holy Spirit. And then sometime later, there is a baptism in the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit comes on you. All right? So then you could say, well, maybe that's just for the disciples. Maybe they were just a special group of people. Well, um, that holds water until Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, this is what it says. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God. So let's just stop right there and let's talk about that. Samaria is, where, where, who would live in Samaria? Samaritans. So these are not even full-blooded Jews. So they're not only not disciples, they're not even full-blooded Jews, okay? These are Samaritans, the lowest low lowlifes in all of society. And it says that they accepted the word of God. When the Bible is saying a group of people accepted the word of God, can we assume that they're saved? 
Of course we can. And if we assume they're saved, then what do we assume? That they've received the Holy Spirit. Because Romans 8 9 says, when someone gets saved, and when they belong to Christ, they've received the Holy Spirit. Okay? So these people had accepted the Word of God. They sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. So here are people saved and baptized, and yet the Holy Spirit had not come on them. So once again, you have this experience of, of, that was normal in the New Testament of people who, who have this moment of salvation where they receive the Holy Spirit. Maybe they're even baptized, and yet there's another point where the Holy Spirit is, comes on them by the laying on of the apostles' hands. Now watch what happens. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So, so in these people in Samaria, this was their experience. They got saved, they received the Holy Spirit, they were baptized, and then sometime later, Peter and John show up, they place their hands on them, and, they, and the Holy Spirit comes on them. And something happens, you don't know what happens, but something happens that is so unbelievable that Simon, who was the town sorcerer, he was the town witch doctor, was so impressed by the outward sign of the giving of the Holy Spirit that he offered them money for the same ability. Which tells you it's different for salvation. Let me prove it to you. Has any, you ever seen somebody get saved? You ever seen somebody get saved? Of course. Well, what happens? Tell me what you see. You just, I mean, someone raises their hand or they come up to an altar or they pray a prayer. It's, it's not anything that you would offer money for, but whatever happened when the apostles laid their hands on this guy, on these people that was, that was in Samaritans, the town witch doctor was so impressed by the outward sign of what happened, he offered money for the same ability. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So once again, with the apostles, they got saved, they received the Holy Spirit, and then sometime later there was a baptism in the Holy Spirit where it came upon them. In Samaria, the same believers get saved, they get baptized, and then sometime later Peter and John show up and they get baptized in the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit comes on them. The, the, next, the next time this happens is in Acts chapter 10. And Peter's preaching at a man's house. And this is what it says. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on. There's that word again. The Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. So, so in other words, so there's these believers. Again, he's, and, and in this case, there's not laying on of hands. There's not even praying. In this case, Peter's just preaching. He's just having a home meeting. He's just preaching. And it says the Holy Spirit came on all who heard it. And it says that the Jews there could not believe that the gift of the Holy Spirit came on them. That the gift of the Holy Spirit came on them because they were Gentiles. And, and, and the way they knew that the gift of the Holy Spirit came on them was they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. So watch what happens. Then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? For they, listen to this next phrase, for they have received the Holy Spirit just like we have. Just like we have. So, so how did Peter receive the Holy Spirit? Jesus breathed on him and they received the Holy Spirit. So he breathed on them, they received the Holy Spirit, and then sometime later there's this baptism in the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues and did all the things that they did at, uh, at, in Acts chapter 2. So, so Jesus promises the Holy Spirit in Acts 1.8, then Acts chapter 2 happens a few days later and that's Pentecost where they all speak in tongues. So that's how, the Holy Spirit, that's how Peter received the Holy Spirit. He got, he got saved, he received the Holy Spirit. Forty days later there's this promise and then the, the day of Pentecost happens and they speak in tongues. And so Peter looks at these people's experience and he goes, wait a minute, these Gentiles are receiving the Holy Spirit just like we did. Just like we did. Now, there was a problem. And the problem was they were Gentiles. And so these Jewish people have a real problem with Gentiles. I mean, they, Jewish people believe they should have been the special ones. And they are. 
But they, but you, you know and I know, basic human beings, people are just people. Basic human beings is, is if I see God blessing you, there's something in me that gets jealous. And so they, give, they read Peter the Riot Act. And I'm not going to read all of it, but they read Peter the Riot Act. They, they're just like, what is going on here? How can you, Peter, let this happen? How can you let this happen? And their question, they even call a special meeting so that they can chastise him. And watch Peter's defense in Acts 11. This goes on for a whole chapter of the Bible. In Acts 11, 15 through 17, Peter defends what happens. And this is what he says. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them just as he had come on us at the beginning. So in other words, what happened at the day of Pentecost happened there. That's all I'm telling you. That's what I saw. Can I defend it theologically? No. Can I explain myself? No. I'm just telling you all I was doing was preaching, and this happened. Now watch what he says. Then I remembered what the Lord said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So whatever he saw there. Now remember, there's a group of Christians. Listen to him preaching. In the middle of the sermon, the Holy Spirit comes on all who hear. They speak in tongues and praise God. He gets attacked for it. And he says, listen, the Holy Spirit came on them just as he came on us in the beginning. And this reminded me that Jesus told us we'd be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So whatever he witnessed there, Peter makes it synonymous with being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he says this, so, I love Peter's answer, this is so good. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then who was I to think I could oppose God? I, I love that. I, he's, like, he's like, you want a theological answer? I don't have one. I just know what I saw, and I know it had to be God. And if it's God, who was I to think I could oppose him? So if you want to oppose him, you go for it. But I cannot do that. I love that. I love the fact that we don't have to defend what God does in our lives. That a lot of times what God does in our lives doesn't have to make theological sense to people who think they know theology. It only has to make sense to you and God, and sometimes not even that. Sometimes not even you. Sometimes it's okay to just experience something in God that you don't have to explain every single detail of it. It's just freeing to know that God gives his children good gifts. And so when Peter sees this, so once again, you have the apostles sort of experience, which was saved, received the Holy Spirit, 40 days later, they're promised the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then Acts chapter 2 happens, they speak in tongues and it comes on them. Then you have the people in Samaria, same experience. They're saved, then a period of time elapses, and they get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then Acts chapter 10, same, same type of thing, different people. They're saved, sometime later the Holy Spirit comes on them, and they speak in tongues and praise God. Now, the, other, the, the last instance happens in Acts chapter 18 and 19. So let's read that together. It says this. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. Now, that's a good compliment. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately. They liked this guy. But watch the next phrase. Though he only knew the baptism of John. Though he only knew the baptism of John, which was obviously baptism in water. So, so, so Jesus, is, I mean, the writer of Acts, Luke, he's saying this guy was a great pastor. He knew his stuff. He taught about the word of God accurately. He was a great speaker, a great theologian. If I could fault him in any way, it would be he only knew the baptism of John. Now, if I say to you, you know what, you're a great man. You're a great woman. You have a thorough knowledge of scripture. You have this, you have that. You have, oh, man, you've got it going on, but you only know the baptism of John. What is the, what is the natural question? The, the natural question is what other baptism is there? I mean, what other baptism is there? There must be another baptism. Now watch what happens. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Now keep in mind, the only missing piece in his whole theology was he only knew the baptism of John. So it just is the reason they might have explained what other baptism there was. He, um, to, when, when Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. On arriving, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scriptures Jesus was the Christ. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. So, so let's get our story straight. Apollos is the pastor in Ephesus. He only knows the baptism of John. 
He's on a missionary trip to Corinth, and Paul decides to go through the road and shows up at Ephesus to cover his church for him. And he runs across his church. And so Paul took the road through the end and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, let's stop and make, our, make some notes here. First, who's writing this? Luke's writing this about Paul. And Paul, Paul's asking these people, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Paul wrote a book called Romans, chapter 8, verse 9, where he said, If any man believes in Christ, if he belongs to Christ, then he has received the Holy Spirit. If he doesn't belong to Christ, he doesn't have the Holy Spirit. So for Paul to ask, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he must be talking about something else. Obviously, they had received the Holy Spirit when they believed. Obviously, these people were saved. Paul's calling them disciples. If he's calling them disciples, then they're saved. They had received the Holy Spirit. Now watch what, watch what happens. They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. We haven't even heard that. They only knew the baptism of John. They didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, now watch the natural question. Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? Now without even reading, if you know that these people's pastor is Apollos, and Apollos only knows the baptism of John, what baptism would you think they've received? John's. John's, and, and that's what they say. They say, John's baptism. And Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to, be, to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. But then when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied, and there was about 12 men in all. So once again... You have the same kind of experience in Ephesus as you did in Samaria, in, 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 in the house meeting that Peter was doing, in Acts chapter 1, 8, Acts chapter 2. You have the same kind of experience. You have people who are saved, they're disciples, they're, they're baptized into John's baptism, they, they, they understand this stuff, and then later on there's an experience where the Holy Spirit comes on them, and it's normally accompanied with this thing of tongues or spiritual language. So, so what is the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Well, in John chapter 7, Jesus talks about it this way. He says that there is an inflow of the Holy Spirit when someone gets saved. But then the baptism of the Holy Spirit says rivers of living water will flow out of him. So, so the inflow of the Holy Spirit is when you get saved. But then after salvation, you have an outflow of the Holy Spirit. And that is the baptism in the Holy Spirit where it just overflows you. H how do we receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Well, we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit very simply. Number one. Obviously, number one is to be a believer in Jesus Christ. But, but after that, simply ask God to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. In, in Luke chapter 11, and, and I don't have it written out there, but this is a really good paraphrase of it. It's, it says that Jesus says this, it, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And then it says, I'm paraphrasing, but it says something like this. Um, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit if you simply ask him? So Jesus says that, that more of the Holy Spirit can be given just by asking. So, so when a person receives the Holy Spirit at salvation, does he get all the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes, he does. But even though he gets all of the Holy Spirit, is there an extra baptism in the Holy Spirit that's available to every believer? Absolutely, yes. You say, Shane, explain that. No. No, I'm going to be like Peter. I have no idea. You can ask God when you get to heaven one day, but you won't need to ask him because you'll fully know because you'll be fully known. You will see him face to face. There is a, you, get, you get the Holy Spirit without measure at the moment of salvation. Now, there is a difference of awareness of God, and that's part of what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does. There's this one scripture where it says, God was with me all along. I just didn't know it. I just didn't know it. And so the baptism of the Holy Spirit increases our awareness of God. But if, if, without getting into all the specifics, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, is an overflow of the Holy Spirit. Even though we get all of God at salvation, all the Spirit of God at salvation, there's an extra baptism that's subsequent to that that God wants us to have. Number two, at, so number one, ask God to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Number two, ask God to release in you all the resources for communicating with him, including spiritual language. Including spiritual language. See, we get really, really messed up with this tongue stuff. And I'm going to talk about tongues in just a second. But we get really messed up with this tongue stuff. And, and the reason we do is because, um, well, honestly, people made it weird. Pentecostals made it weird. I, I, think, I think Pentecostals, it, it, look, 
we, we should be able to talk about ourselves. I don't even call myself a Pentecostal anymore because of, of the connotation it gives people. I'm, I'm invited all over the world to preach in Baptist churches, Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches, and whatever. Even though I'm from a Pentecostal background, I just don't even, I don't even go there because it doesn't mean that anymore. Normally, when, when, when someone thinks of a Pentecostal, they, they think of, of, of tongue talking. And can we be honest? I mean, like, it's almost like we had a board of people trying to come up with the weirdest way to, to talk about stuff. Like, like, it, like the, the power of God comes on an infinite person. So the power of an infinite God comes on, an inf, comes on a finite person and they lose their ability to stand. The power of God just overwhelms that person and they can't even stand in the presence of God. Now, how awesome is that? That is awesome. What do we call it? Slain, which means to kill something violently. Like, what are we thinking? Like, why, why wouldn't people want to be involved in that? <laughs> I mean, what are we, what are we doing? Like, like real slain? Like, no, I mean, like the power of an infinite God overwhelms somebody with his love and compassion and power, and they can't even stand in his presence. And instead of coming up with some way to say that beautifully, we call it slain. We do the same thing with tongues. Tongues is a horrible translation. The word tongues came from 1611. There was this guy, his name was King James. He was very important. And, and he, 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 he translated the, the, the first English Bible. And, and in 1611, when he looked at the word glossolalia, which just means languages, the, the word for languages in 1611 in England was tongues. So if someone was really educated, they'd, and they could talk a lot of languages, they'd say, oh, he spoke many tongues. That was the common language of the day. What's the word for languages now? Languages. So it's just languages. What do we call it? We have to, because we're weird. We have to call it tongues, which is... It's like, what did you do today? Oh, I spoke in... And, and, and we wonder why people don't want anything to do with it. We, we, we paint it as though we lose control of ourselves, And, oh, no one wants to lose control of themselves. And so, oh, so what did you do at church today? Oh, it was so fantastic. We all got slain and spoken. Mm. I mean, why wouldn't any... Can you imagine why people just wouldn't want anything to do with it? Slain. Oh, so you killed people violently and you... Tongues. Tongues. And instead of painting it as pretty as the Bible does, we had to make it weird. And it's not weird. When you read the, when you read the New Testament, it was the normative experience for the New Testament believer. It was just something that happened that they just thought, hey, that's, that's normal. That's normal. So, so number two, ask God to release in you all the resources for communicating with him. Number three, by faith speak and the spiritual language will come. See, the disciples lived with Jesus for three, for three years. And Jesus said they needed the baptism in the Holy Spirit before they entered into kingdom mission. If they needed it, then so do we. Then so do we. Now, I want to spend the rest of this session talking about spiritual language. And if I can, instead of calling it tongues, I'm going to call it spiritual language. Because it's less weird. And, and it's, it's, it's something that uh, just sounds more normal and makes more sense than tongues. The word glossolalia is a Greek word used in the Bible. It literally means languages. In 1611, when King James translated the Bible, he translated it tongues. Uh, the, the word spiritual language would be a modern translation of glossolalia. It uses the root word languages and captures the context of the message. Glossolalia is speaking in languages that come from your spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, 14. Now, there's three pictures of spiritual language in the Bible. There's three types of spiritual language. Most things that come out of God are three-dimensional because God's three-dimensional. So, so God's three-dimensional, so are you, your spirit, soul, body, okay? Um, most things come out of God are three-dimensional, okay? And, and spiritual language is no different. What, when you look at the Bible, you see three basic forms of spiritual language. One form is like, I'll call it an evangelistic or missionary use of spiritual language. And, and this is when, um, it, it, you see this in Acts uh, chapter 2, when you have a lot of unbelievers believers standing around and everybody's speaking in languages and it says they heard them in their own language they heard them declaring the wonders of god in their own language so so you see that and you see this on the mission field today when people are in some village and they can't speak the language and god supernaturally gives them an ability to communicate with these people 
Now, now once again, once again, with all respect to, to look, to all, with all respect to people who say that the gift ceased when the Bible was, was, was completed, I respect you and I honor you. I do. I'm telling you, 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 there's a lot of good men of God who believe that. But, but, but there's, a, there's a hole in this that, that to say that we don't need that gift because the Bible's completed. Well, what if you're, that's a real ethnocentric way of looking at things. That's saying, well, because we can read, everybody can read. Because we can speak English, everybody can speak English. Because, because the Bible's translated into our language, the Bible must be translated into everybody's language. I mean, come on, we're not so ignorant to think that there's not people groups in this world who can't read and we can't speak their language. And the only way to communicate to them that God loves them is through somehow God giving us some kind of supernatural way to communicate with them. Of course that's true. Now, the, the, other, the, other, the second type of, of spiritual language you see in the Bible is, is a sort of public word of prophecy where somebody gives a word uh, in, in, in a spiritual language and then interprets it, and it's meant for the consumption of the whole body, for the whole body. The third type of spiritual language is a personal spiritual language for use in your private prayer and worship with God, and it is supposed to be private. It's supposed to be private. Now, uh, with, to take the first one and put it aside for a second, I want to deal for the rest of the session with the third one. But there's a real confusion between the third one and the second one, and that's no different than the New Testament. In the, in the book of Corinthians, Paul is writing to a group of people in Corinth, and they started to confuse the use of a public... Um, a public use of spiritual language and the private use of spiritual language. And what that was creating, as you can imagine, it was creating a lot of chaos. People were coming to church and they were just, everybody was speaking a spiritual language um, just out loud and it was chaotic and people were going, people were going, wait a minute, what's going on here? And Paul's saying, no, 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 don't do that. Let me explain to you the difference between a public form of, of spiritual language, which we need to put rules around, and then a private form of spiritual language, which we need to have freedom in. And so that's what 1 Corinthians 14 is all about. So I just want to go through 1 Corinthians 14 with you. And, and just make some observations, and, and then, and then we'll, we'll bring this to, a, to a, uh, a conclusion. It says this, Follow the way of love, but eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. So my first observation is this, is that it is okay for you to seek and desire spiritual things. This idea that if God didn't just give it to me, I'm not going to go after it. No, no, no. That's a, no, it is okay for you to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. As a matter of fact, we're commanded to. For anyone, now, now, but before we go on, I want you to get this in your mind. There's two forms of spiritual language we're talking about here. We're talking about public and private. And he's trying to show the difference between the two and draw boundaries around it. Now, watch what he says. For anyone who speaks in, in tongues or spiritual language, anyone who speaks in spiritual language does not speak to men but to God. So, so, so now which one is he talking about, public or private? If you're not speaking to men, you're speaking to God, he's talking about you're private. So he's saying, he's saying it's, it's, it's private, it's between you and God. Indeed, no one understands him, he utters mysteries with his spirit. So one of the things that we accomplish when we pray in our spiritual language is that we utter mysteries with our spirit. And I'm going to talk about that here in a second. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. So now which one's he talking about? Public. He's saying, now listen, in private, you're speaking between you and God, and no one understands you. You're uttering mysteries. But if you prophesy, if it's something that's understandable, then, then you're speaking to men for their comfort and strength and encouragement. It's a great thing to do. Now, I want to make, a, I want to make a, a, a point here. Paul is not against any of it. He's not saying it's good or bad. He's just saying, in this context, it's this, and in this context, it's this. So just watch your context. Now watch this. He says, he who speaks in spiritual language edifies himself. Which one are we talking about? Private. But he who prophesies edifies the church. Public. I would like every one of you to speak in spiritual language. Well, that's a pretty good endorsement, isn't it? I mean, that's a ringing endorsement in the New Testament by a major apostle. I would like every one of you to speak in spiritual language. He's not saying it's bad. He's making a comparative statement. Watch what he says. But I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in spiritual language unless he interprets so that the church might be edified. So in other words, he's saying, listen, 
it, it, with this speaking a spiritual language thing, I want all of you to speak in spiritual language, but when you're in the church, make sure it's done in a way that edifies everybody else. Don't, don't put your own stuff out there in front of everybody. For this reason, anyone who speaks in spiritual language should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in spiritual language, my spirit prays. So right there, this is a, in, in the Greek language, uh, there's four classes of conditional clauses. One class, the first class conditional clause, is one that assumes the if is true. So you see this in Matthew where he says, if you are the son of God. So if you are the son of God, then cast yourself down. Um, in, in Greek, it would, it would literally read this. If you are the son of God, and you are, cast yourself down. Okay? The second class conditional clause is one that assumes the if to be false. You see this in Galatians. If you were faithful people, and you're not, you would have done this. Okay? The third class conditional clause is one that assumes future probability of fulfillment. Future probability of fulfillment. The fourth class conditional clause assumes future improbability of fulfillment. The fourth class is never used in the whole Bible, so don't worry about it. This class conditional clause is a third class conditional clause. So what he's saying is this, is if I pray in spiritual language, and I will, my spirit prays. My spirit prays. Now, as far as I know, as far as I can find, this is the only place in the whole Bible that, that, that praying in the spirit is defined. He's saying, if you're praying in spiritual language, that, that is spirit prayer. So later when he says, pray in the spirit, you have to, the same writer writes both of them, you have to assume that his definitions are consistent. The, I mean, one of the basic rules of hermeneutics is you have to let the Bible interpret itself. So if the Bible says that praying in the spirit equals praying in spiritual language, then you have to assume when it says pray in the spirit that it's talking about praying in spiritual language. It, it, you, the properties have to go together. So he says, if I pray in, in, this, in my spiritual language, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. In other words, I don't know what I'm saying. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit. In other words, I'll pray in tongues or pray in my spiritual language, but I'll also pray with my mind. In other words, I'm going to pray in the spirit sometime and I'm going to pray in English sometimes. And, and he's going to get to this in a second. And I control which one I do. It's very important that you understand later in this passage, he says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet's control. That is very important because, listen, if, if we're not careful, we become these super spiritual people and then we act like we can't control ourselves. And that's never true. It is very important that we understand that our spirit is subject to our control. It has to be. It has to be. I mean, look, anytime you have a moment in church where somebody is making a show of themselves and you confront them and you say, listen, you're making a show of yourself, and they say, I just can't help it. The Spirit's on me. I just can't help it. Well, wait a minute now. That only works in, in, in certain situations. I mean, can you imagine if you weren't in control of your spirit? Can you imagine the disaster that would happen? What if your spiritual gift was teaching and you couldn't control your spirit and you're standing in Woolworths? You're standing on the jam and jelly aisle at Woolworths, and you just can't help yourself. You just start teaching. They would haul you off to the nut house. What, what if your spiritual gift was administration, and you just couldn't help yourself? What if your spiritual gift was encouragement, and you just couldn't help yourself? So right now, while I'm talking, you just have to walk around encouraging everybody. That, no, that doesn't work. Your spirit's always subject to your control. So Paul's saying, listen, there's going to be times where you're going to pray in the spirit, and there's going to be times where you're going to pray with your mind. And both are okay. That's okay. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. Now watch this. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who don't understand say amen to your thanksgiving since he does not know what you're saying? So he's saying, if you're praising God with your spirit, in other words, if you're using your spiritual language, a private thing, if you're using it in a public setting, the people who don't understand, how can they say amen? They don't know what you're saying. Now watch what he says. You may be giving thanks well. In other words, what you're doing is a good thing. It's just that people don't understand it. But the other man's not edified. I thank God that I speak in spiritual language more than all of you. Now, that's a pretty resounding endorsement. I thank God that I speak in spiritual language more than all of you. But, that's private, but in the church, public, I would rather speak five intelligent words to instruct others than 10,000 words in spiritual language. 
So what should we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. If anyone speaks in spiritual language, two or at most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. Is that public or private? Public. Public. Two or at most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet. Where? In the church. But continue to speak to himself and to God. In other words, if, if, if it's your private spiritual language, don't stop. Just keep it private. Keep your private stuff between you and God private. That's really good advice. Two or three prophets should speak. The others should weigh carefully what he said. And if a revelation comes to someone who's sitting down, the first speaker should stop. He's putting all these boundaries around public stuff. Because you've got to have order. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the control of the prophet. In other words, when you're trying to put order into the public setting of all this, don't let anybody tell you they can't control themselves. You can. You, and not only can you, you have to control yourself for the good of everybody else. This is very, very important. For the good of everybody else, control yourself. For God is not a God of disorder but of peace. As in all the congregation of the saints, women should remain silent in the church. And all God's people said, <laughs> Women should remain silent in the church. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the Torah says. I guess we ought to stop and explain that. The word for woman there is not the word for women in general. It's the word for wife. The word for women in general is gune. The word for wife is mater, where we get the word maternal from. He's saying wives should keep quiet in the church and be in submission. Now, what's the context of this whole scripture? The context of this scripture is not in general. Just It's not shut your mouth. In general, it's testing prophecy. When someone gave a word of prophecy in the first century, they had a bench of three. And someone would give the word of prophecy, but they didn't just give prophecy. They had to test the prophecy. And so men sat on one side of the room, and women sat on the other, and they would test the prophecy. And what Paul's saying is this, is wives, don't question your husband's prophecies in public. It'll destroy your home. And it doesn't, I mean, can you imagine a man giving a word of prophecy and the bench of three saying, okay, let's test it, and his wife saying, listen, I don't know about y'all, but I woke up with him that morning, and I'm telling you, he is full of it. <laughs> can you imagine how destructive that would be at home? Can you imagine what kind of environment that would be at home? So Paul's saying, listen, don't, don't do that. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't permit you to have authority over your husband. The word for man there is not the word for men, anthropolo anthropo something, it's anthropology. All right? It's not the word for men in general, it's the word pater, which is paternal, it's husband. Fathers. So he's saying, listen, in the context of testing prophecy, don't embarrass your husband in public. That's, that's, the, that's, what, that's the context of this. They're not allowed to speak, must be in submission, as Paul said. If they want to inquire, they should ask their husbands at home. For it is disgraceful for a woman to speak out in the church. In other words, the context is, the, the, this passage never leaves the context of prophecy. Never. It never goes to, oh, you should never teach, oh, you should never, no, no, you should never pastor, you ne no, no, no. It never leaves the context of prophecy, of testing prophecy. And you can see it. He says, if you've got a question about your husband's prophecy, ask him at home. Don't embarrass that man in public. You don't do that. You don't do that. Did the word of God originate with you, or are you the only people it has reached? If anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in spiritual language. But everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. In other words, his conclusion is this. Be eager to edify everybody, but don't forbid the private use of spiritual language. That is so important. 
I thank my God I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I'd rather speak five intelligible words than 10,000 words in a tongue. But in private, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than all of you. So, so why, why pray in spiritual language? Why do it? I mean, does God not understand English? I mean, seriously, I mean, does God not understand English? Why do we need to do that? And in this passage of Scripture, it gives us several reasons. Number one, communion with God. That it's just another way to communicate with God. And how many of you know that if God gave us a way to communicate with Him, it's something we ought to use? It's just something we ought to use. Number two, we're uttering mysteries with our spirit. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, it talks about m- the mysteries of God being something that He ordained for our glory before time began. So when we pray with our spirit, we are calling things into being that God destined for our glory before time ever began. We're calling those mysteries down. The things that honestly, you know what people say, yeah, but your mind's unfruitful. Yeah, but you know what? Isn't that a good thing sometimes? Isn't that good? Like sometimes it's the best for your mind to be unfruitful. Because I think if you really heard God's best will for your life being spoken out of your mouth, it would be so much more than you could ever ask, think, or imagine. It would mess you up. It would mess us up. So we're uttering mysteries in the spirit. Number, number three, we're building our strength. It says, he who prays in a spiritual language edifies himself. Number four, we're obeying the command to pray in the spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, 14, if I pray in my unknown language, my spirit prays. Later on in, in, in Jude chapter 20 and, and in other places, he commands us to pray in the spirit. N- number, number five, to praise in the spirit. To praise in the spirit. Number six, to pray perfectly. To pray perfectly. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 to 27 says this, For we know not how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit of God makes intercession for us with groanings that words cannot express. In other words, in other words, when you get to a place where you don't know what to pray, the best thing to do is utilize this tool that God gave every believer in private for our private edification so that we can have God pray to himself through our mouth. Number next, we should pray in the Spirit to build our faith. Jude chapter 20 says, My brothers, build yourself in the most holy faith by praying in the Spirit. The next one is to complete the armor of God. See, we, we, we always teach the armor of God. Helmet of salvation. Shield of faith. Breastplate of righteousness. Belt of truth. Feet, uh, with feet the, the shoes of peace. Uh, the sword of the Spirit. But, but that's not the last piece of the armor. And, and he's commanding us to, to, uh, to, to, to put on the armor of God. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith, belt of, uh, belt of truth, uh, shoes of peace, sword of the Spirit. But this is how Ephesians ends it. It says, and take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Now, if you're an English teacher, I can tell you, you, can't end, you cannot end a, a thought on and. And take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions. So it actually, to pray in the Spirit completes the armor of God. But the last reason, probably the most important, is this. Is to be obedient. There's several places in the New Testament that commands us to utilize our spiritual language by praying in the Spirit. Ephesians 6.18 and Jude 20. They're both commands. Brothers, build yourself up in the most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. It's a command. Ephesians 6.18 Pray in the Holy Spirit. It's a command. It's, if for no other reason, we should utilize it because we trust God enough. How can we trust God with things like our eternal salvation, how we handle our money, all of that stuff, and yet we ignore something as simple as praying in the Spirit? But here, here's what I understand. Now I want you to listen to me. I understand this. If you're afraid of this thing, I want you to understand something. I understand that. And I am so sorry from the bottom of of my Pentecostal heart. I am so sorry for what we did to tongues by making it so weird. And I'm here to tell you there's nothing weird about it. It is a normative experience that every that, that these believers had in the New Testament. They received the Holy Spirit, and sometime later they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and at their baptism in the Holy Spirit, they received this grace to be able to pray in the Holy Spirit by praying in an unknown language so that they could utter mysteries in their spirit that God ordained for them before time began, but they would have never had the faith to say otherwise. It's our love language between us and God. It's, it's our language God gave us. It's pillow talk between us and God. It, it's, it's the culmination of, of, of really a marriage proposal 
If you understand it all the way back to, to Sinai, the people saw at the bottom of Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, it says they saw thunder and lightning. In Hebrew, it says they saw languages inside fire. <laughs> they saw kole. Kole is, is, is voices or languages. They saw kole inside fire. So they look up and they see languages inside fire. Where do you see that again? At Acts chapter 2 and Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 and the bottom of Mount Sinai is the exact same day. It's the anniversary of the same day. It's the exact same day. They were together in one accord celebrating that day. The only difference between Mount Sinai and Pentecost is at Pentecost we spoke back, which is the birth of the church, which is the bride of Christ. Our spiritual language is our special language between us and our, and our groom. It, it's, it's the language that only you would understand in the most intimate of relationships. It's that language that, that allows us to speak mysteries. It's God whispering his vision for our life in our ear and then giving us the faith to speak it out even though we don't know what we're saying. That's spiritual language. I bless you tonight to know that this, is, this, this normative experience is available for every single one of you. I bless you to know that God loves you so much, he wants to fill you even more than he might have already have. Give you a greater awareness of him so that we could glorify God and ultimately take this message of the gospel and this best life to the whole world. Let's pray together. Now, Lord, you're the best. And we love you so much. We honor you. And we ask you again tonight, Lord, to baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Lord, uh, release the power of God in our life. Lord, bless us tonight. Bless us tonight as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.